So today we're going to be back in the book of Mark, and we're going to be looking at Jesus's um, betrayal and his arrest and the beginning of his trials. Okay. This is the preparation for sacrifice. Now, you know, we've walked with Jesus from the beginning of Mark all the way through to this point where he's been walking with his disciples. We see him spending time with them. And in his early ministry, we saw miracles and they did a bunch of traveling. They were a lot of, in Galilee. They were stationed at Capernaum. They were doing all of these wonderful things and Jesus was pretty left alone. But as we get closer and closer to what we know will be the climax of all human history, which is the crucifixion of God's only son, Jesus Christ, the pressure is more and more upon Jesus and his disciples. Jesus is going to go through six trials, none of them right, and there's going to be three that are religious and three that are secular. So as we look at them, we'll go over them and note some of the differences. And I, I don't know about you, but how many people need to go through six trials? Well, there are some. They usually call that double jeopardy. So previously, we were looking at Jesus as he was spending the last day, last 24 hours with his disciples. And there's more written about this one week than any other time frame in the New Testament about Jesus's last and final week. We looked at the plotting of the chief priests and the Pharisees and the, the rulers and how they said, we've, we've got to get it done. We need to get rid of him, but we can't do it during the feast because the people will get all upset, and we don't want to upset the people. So they were more concerned with people than they were with God. They didn't mind performing a murder. They just didn't want people to be upset about it. So it's classic people-pleasing. And then we saw Mary, how she came with this alabaster jar of incredible worth. Um, it, it's about a year's wages, so whatever a year's wages, that's what was inside of there. Um, and she came and anointed Jesus' body. And there were those who were critical of that. And they said, well, why, why does she waste this ointment and pour it out? Um, she's pouring it out in worship of Jesus, and Jesus accepts it. And she ex he explains that she did this in preparation of my body for my burial, because she was he's going to get crucified tomorrow morning. There's going to be no more cleaning up. And he said, she's doing this for my burial. And Mary was always at the feet of Jesus always knew what was going on. The disciples didn't get it. Nobody seemed to get it, but Mary got it. And so the night before he's betrayed and he's turned over and crucified, she anoints his body with this ointment, which is everything she had. Uh, most women wear it around their neck. It's one of the few things that you can wear on, the, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. It, and because of its worth, they said, well, you, you can't let that thing go. So you get, okay, we'll permit you to carry that uh, in, in the Mishnah. But it's very often uh, a symbol that you're single and it's a way that you can buy yourself a man. Yeah, that's what a dowry is. I don't know if you know that. Uh, Delia, you didn't buy yourself a man, right? Okay, I didn't think so. Oh, by the way, uh, Brian and Delia were married right here yesterday. For those of you that may not have known but uh, it, it was a pleasure to, to see them married. Anyway, moving on, Judas sees this and he absolutely is fuming that this ointment couldn't be sold and given to the poor. What he means is it could have been sold and the money put in the wallet, which he held and he helped himself to. John actually gives us that longer explanation. Mark is just giving us the facts uh, like a dragnet character. And so, Judas was jealous of Jesus and all of this that was lavished on him, and he wasn't able to get his hands on the money, and so he said, that's it, I'm turning him in, and I'll see what I could get, see what they'll give me to turn in Jesus. And, you know, we all can have that kind of a heart. We have to be careful. So, and, and, and there are people that are like that, too. And so, this mission, Jesus says, I want you to go and get the place ready for us. And so he said, takes two disciples, like he had two disciples when he was going into Jerusalem, and they had to go jack a cult. Here, they're going in, and they're going to find a guy carrying, you'll go into the city, and you'll see a man carrying a water pitcher. Follow him, 
and whenever he goes in, tell the master, where is the room that you have prepared for me? <laughs> okay. And, you know, I had Mission Impossible music in the background in my head. And so there's these guys, and so carrying a, a water pitcher is a little weird because women are the ones who do that kind of thing and not men. So finding a man ca carrying a water pitcher wasn't so weird. Um, it is weird, and that's why he stood out. And so the disciples suddenly are following this guy. And you, you, you know when, you, when you're driving and somebody's, like, too close to you, so you move over, and then they move over? And so you say, well, let me move over again. And they move over again. You say, I think I'm being followed. You take your exit and they keep going and you go, oh. But this, these guys really were following him and that's exactly what happened. And so they went in and prepared the room and got ready and Jesus and his disciples come at night and they set up and they, they set up for Leonardo da Vinci's painting. You know. <laughs> sitting in European chairs. And, and so Jesus is there and saying, one of you is going to betray me. And of course, that's going to spark competition and stir the men. And they're going to say, well, not me. Well, not me. Is it me? No, not me. No, I think it's you. No, it's not me. It's you. If you had brothers, you know what this is like. And so we saw Jesus say, it would be better if that man were never been born because he has to take personal responsibility. And yet it was prophesied that one would be a betrayer and Jesus knew it would happen and he knew who it was. In fact, John was the one who leaned over to him during the supper and said, Lord, who's the one that betrays you? He goes, it's the one who's going to dip in the dish with me. And he dips into the dish, takes, you know, maybe a little a little olive oil inside the thing. It's different. And, and, sudden, and it's Judas and him at the same time. And his eyes meet Judas and he says, do what you must do quickly. And Judas leaves and it says that the devil entered him. And it was night. Yeah, it was a dark night of the soul too. And he leaves and he goes to turn him in. Jesus then leaving goes to the Mount of Olives and there are three crests on the Mount of Olives and he goes up there among the grove and he's taking his disciples with him. And so that's where we left off last week. So we're going to pick it up in verse 27. And then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. This is a different declaration. He's saying they're all going to stumble. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. I think he said it like that. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And you would think that would be enough for Peter. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Right, right, me too, me too, me too. <laughs> Jesus is saying, this is the way it's going to roll out, but I'll meet you in Galilee, okay? Never, no. No, Lord. It's a strange sentence, isn't it? Lord means you're the boss, I do what you tell me to do, and no is, how do you say no to your Lord? No, Lord. It's weird. You ever say no, Lord? Yes. Yeah. Make sure you just say no and just sit with it ringing in your ears for a minute. That's helpful. He makes this prophecy, he says, because the prophecy is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. It's interesting because we don't have a, a real deep, rich understanding of the Old Testament. And so when he says, just like it's written in the Old Testament, we're like, all right, I'll take your word for it, Jesus. Because you, you might not know Zechariah real well, but Zechariah 13, 6 and 7 has traditionally been a, a messianic psalm. Now listen to what Zechariah says long before Jesus is on the face of the planet. And one will say to him, what are those wounds between your arms? And they will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. 
Isn't that spooky? Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. God is calling him his companion, his equal. Says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now you and I, reading through Zechariah, not having an understanding of who Jesus is, would just walk through that and go, yeah, I don't know what that means. But Jesus takes the occasion to point back and show us how to understand prophecy in the Old Testament. Where'd you get those wounds? I got them at the house of my friends. Who betrayed him? Judas. It says in the book of John, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He came to his own creation because he created all things. And he came to his own people and he was rejected. Jesus could say, the wounds that I have, Thomas, that you should stick your fingers in and plunge your arm into, these were at the house of my friends, the people of God, Israel, the ones who were waiting for the Messiah. And so we see the prophet uh, was pretty sharp on being able to write this, and it's always done in an artistic manner. And strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus understood this to be that the Messiah would come and he would be struck and he would have wounds and that the sheep would all scatter. And he interprets the Old Testament passage to his disciples. I think that's pretty cool. If you go through Matthew, Matthew's big on picking up Old Testament scriptures and applying them to Jesus in the here and now. And every time he pulls one of those scriptures, if you go back into the Old Testament and read the context, you'd be like, how did he get that? Because prophecy is a hard thing, isn't it? It's hard to kind of nail down and understand. I'm not sure it's for us to understand the future. I think it's for us to understand the future when it comes, we go, aha. Because that's what it was for them. So Peter's strong refusal to believe what Jesus is telling him is simply pride and his continued refusal is rebellion in the highest order. Wouldn't you agree? Jesus says, listen, you're all going to leave me. No, never, Lord, never. You're totally wrong. You're way off. Oh, yeah? Well, let me be a little clearer. <laughs> By the time morning happens and the crow, you know, he crows twice, the, the, uh, the male rooster, which if you've lived next to them, you know they do this. And by the time he crows twice, you'll have denied me three times. And he says, no way, in Jersey form. <laughs> no way. This is never going to happen. I will die for you. You know, that's a pretty strong attestation, isn't it? I wonder, how many times do we sing worship songs and we say things and maybe our heart really isn't there? I, I sing songs that I sing because I want my heart to be there. You know, God, my God, I cry out. Your beloved needs you now. I can sing that with all faith. Can you? I need God's help. So do you. And when the Lord says something to you, don't brush it off. Because Peter's brushing it off to his own peril. And it's his own pride, saying, I'd never do that. I'm, my faith is so strong. <gasps> oh, Lord, let me step back from you because the lightning bolt is coming. You know what I mean? It's of the highest order. And so Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me tonight. And it looks like it's Peter. Because Jesus came down with this prophecy about you're going to deny me three times before. So everybody's looking at Peter. Oh, I knew it was him. I knew it wasn't me. It's really Judas. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, interesting passage. For Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Now, any of you that haven't got any ram fat hanging around... <laughs> God doesn't want you to do a bunch of stuff. He doesn't want you to sacrifice. He doesn't want you to do. He wants you to be. You follow? 
Being is better than doing. Doing doesn't save you. Being is what saves you. I sum up. Samuel was saying this to Saul. Saul, King Saul, thought he was all that in a bag of chips. Suddenly he's going into battle and he's like, well, Samuel's got to show up because there's a sacrifice we're going to do before God, this whole religious ceremony thing that we're going to do. So we get God's blessing before we go into the battle. And he goes, you know, Samuel's a little late. And he goes, I'll do it. I'll be a priest. And he goes to do a sacrifice and he goes to do all that stuff. And Samuel shows up and says, what are you doing? It's not your place. You should be patient. You should have waited. Samuel goes in and he ransacks a town, the Amalekites, and he takes all of the sheep and the goats, and he even sang, saves this guy named Agag. He's the king. And he, sa he says, ah, we, we wouldn't want to wipe everything out. We'll keep their stuff. But the direction was he was supposed to wipe everything out, and he didn't. So you see, Saul has a track record of just writing his own, you know, script. And because he was keeping all of these animals, and he kept this king alive, Samuel came to him again and said, what, what is this I hear? I hear, I hear sheep going, ah, where do they come from? And I understand King Agag is still alive. I want you to bring him out. <laughs> and Samuel hacks him up in full view of everybody, because that's what the Lord told him to do. This evil king that would rise up to come back. And he says, it's what the Lord wants is obedience. He doesn't he doesn't necessarily have to have you come to church. I know, I'm the pastor saying this. Shame on me. He doesn't want all your money, necessarily. He doesn't want you to cross old ladies across the street. He doesn't want you to do sacrifice and all of that stuff. What he wants is your heart. He wants obedience. Just do what he tells you to do. We make it so complicated, and sometimes it's easier, you know, because if I can serve God in a way I want, well then... Maybe I'll be like Cain and worship God in a way in which I think he should be worshipped instead of the way he told me he wants to be worshipped, which is he wants my whole heart. And so there's a lesson to be learned here with Peter. His rebellion and his refusal is um, just tantamount to rebellion. The next verse in 1 Samuel says this, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And that was the end for Saul. Because he would not be obedient to the Lord. And he says, you know, what you're doing is witchcraft. Which, I thought witchcraft involved a book and a spell and, you know, a bunch of funky ingredients. No. Witchcraft is rebellion. That's what Peter's doing right here. Have you ever caught yourself doing that? You know, like when you want to lose your temper? You know when you want to lose your temper? You feel it, right? Maybe you get a vein popping out right here. You feel your heart racing and you know you're... And you're going to say something or you're going to do something that you shouldn't. Witchcraft. Or being disobedient to that which you know the Lord wants you to do. You know, you know that you know that you know that the Lord wants you to do this thing and you don't. And you keep living with the, no, nah, no, nah, impossible. Never happened, Lord. No, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to. That's where Peter's at. You know, I love the Bible because it's honest. And it shows people how they really are. If I were writing a book about me, I'm not sure I would talk about this if I were Peter. But who's writing this book? God writes the book, but he uses human agents. The name of the book is Mark, and Mark is taking dictation from Peter. And Peter is telling us the story of his betrayal. I wonder how many of you would be so comfortable to be that disclosive. Peter's strong refusal to believe what Jesus is telling him produced a riot as they all joined in telling Jesus that he was wrong. <coughs> Peter says, no way. More vehemently, no way, absolutely not. And everybody said the same thing. They were like, harump, yeah, yeah, right, 
right? Like he, what he said. I'm, yeah, he's no greater than me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna, even, I'll die. I'll, yeah, I'll go to death, yeah, yeah. So we started this crazy competition and this riot really that broke out and Jesus just spoke some truth to them and he said, by the way, when I rise from the dead, meet me in Galilee, I'll go ahead of you. And they didn't hear any of that. Again, it's like the fifth time Jesus is saying this in the book. And because they were so insistent on being defensive, they didn't hear what he said. I wonder how defensive we are and why. Even if somebody's coming against you with something that's completely wrong, shouldn't you hear it? Shouldn't you listen? Shouldn't you be patient? Shouldn't you consider that there might be things going on in their life that cause them to be the way they are? And it really isn't about you. Sometimes. There's two things I see we can do with our words. We can be instruments of rebellion, like Peter was, or we can be instruments of revival. In Philippians, there's this wonderful passage which tells us how we're to think. It says, think on these things. It's got all these wonderful things that we should fill our mind with, which usually it's the opposite. I think our words, because the scripture says so, they either breathe life or they bring death. I could stand up here and recount everything that I saw in the news yesterday, and I'll bet the anxiety level in this room would go way up just by the way that I speak about it. Or I can do what the Lord tells me to do and use my mouth for good and hopefully bring inspiration instead of depression. Amen. And we each all have that choice, but you really have to be very thoughtful in your walk with Christ to be able to do that. But we can bring revival with our words. It doesn't have to be a rebellion. Verse 32, and then they came to the place which is called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now, you know, when Jesus gives instructions, these guys aren't very good at listening, right? <laughs> kind of like us. What did he tell them to do? Oh, repeat after me. Sit here while I pray. Just sit here. Jesus just wants them to sit there. Sit? What? I can't just sit here. How about you? I got I to gotta do something. I, I'm sorry. I can't just sit here. I can't. I got to do something. Are you like that? Yeah. This, get rid of the phone, shut off the TV, get off the internet, and just sit there. While I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. So, here's the gang. He pulls three, goes a little further, plops down, and now he begins to show his heart. Because you can't show your heart to everyone, can you? Do you have a small group of friends that you can share your heart with? I sure hope you do. I hope you don't share your heart with everyone. Because not everyone is worthy of the consumption of all the stuff that you're spewing. Right? You know the type. Hey, how you doing? Well, it started this morning. It was just a general greeting. I'm sorry I asked. Please let me out of here. And there, there are people that, and you wonder, do you pray much? Because, you know, I dumped that junk at God, and, and he takes it all. And he's really gracious, and he's wonderful about listening to me. And he's way more patient than I am. I had a dream, and I don't know what it meant. But you know, last night, I was watching something on TV, and it's something that my friend told me when I was over their house the day before. I thought, hold on a second. Should I be consuming this? Is this edible? So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the special ed crew, and makes sure, because he's got to watch these guys. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. He began to reveal some things he didn't reveal to everybody else. And you know, if you sit with Jesus, he'll do that. Then he said to them, 
my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Now, we've never heard Jesus say anything like this. He's never been troubled like this. He says, stay here and watch. So the second group he told to stay here and watch. watch. Good. You got it. The first group, sit here while I pray. Second group, stay here and watch. You got it. He went a little further. Now he's alone. And he fell on the ground and he prayed that it, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Amen. That's a true statement of theology, is it not? Amen. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now, I don't have enough time today to unpack that. <laughs> Jesus is revealing his humanity, and yet he is deity. And he's realizing that he's going to have to go to the cross. Now, it's not just a bloody death like you and I would suffer. It is a separation from his father. This is the tearing of the Trinity, where Jesus would be separated from God, and he would bear the sins of the whole world. Now, you and I don't even know what it's like to bear our own sins. He's going to bear the sins of the whole world and be separated from his father. All of eternity has had the bliss of celebrating unity and intimacy. And it's now going to be ripped away. And he's saying, because he knows what's coming and he knows exactly what that means. He's saying, father, you could do anything. You could take this away, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You don't really understand it until you've been through it. I don't think we really understand it until we go through it. And we'll never go through it like him. Praise God, he did it for us. The place where they are is Gethsemane. It means the oil, the oil press or the place of crushing. And Jesus is being crushed. It's a rather interesting thing here in the garden. The place of the oil press. Jesus is pressed. So much so in Luke twenty two forty four, Luke giving us a fuller story says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Jesus was torqued up to the point where he was sweating like he was raining. And it was like drops of blood falling from him. That's the distress his soul was in that it affected his body. And Jesus knows what he's about to do. And he's taking stock of it. And I think what he's doing is he's fortifying himself. Because praise God for the nevertheless. God, you can do anything. Take this cup from me. He said it as a, like a command, and you'd figure if Jesus is praying that, it's going to happen, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And do you understand without doing that, there would be no salvation for us? Because it doesn't matter what you do. The death of Jesus Christ is that which brings salvation, and it's faith in his name that makes us children. It's nothing else that we can bring. It's nothing else that we do. And I, for one, am glad for that because I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not religious enough. I don't pray enough. I don't read enough. I'm not kind enough. And there's not a darn thing that I can add to my salvation. It's Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Praying and ascertaining your own will from God's is an exercise in self-awareness as well as intimacy with God. You know, when you're praying, you have to kind of know what it is you want as opposed to what God wants. Or you'll start to think what you want is what God wants. God wants me to be rich. He wants me to win the lottery. Lord, I'm going to go and spend $1 and you're going to make me rich, right? Hallelujah. I knew it. That's God's will for my life. 
can I have one lottery ticket, please? One lottery ticket. You scratch it off, you go, you led me down here, God, <laughs> because you don't know the difference between your will and God's will. And it's one of those things where you better know what you're doing when you jump on your knees and say, Lord, I, I want you to do this thing. Well, is that what you want or is that what God wants? That's hard, isn't it? You have to know enough about yourself. Forgive me, wife. My wife comes to me <laughs> and she'll go, are you hungry? She nods her head yes. <laughs> and she asks me if I'm hungry. I know what that is. She's not asking if I'm hungry. She's telling me she's hungry. You're hungry, right? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> I can always eat. I mean, always. I've had two dinners before, okay? I can eat anytime. And then what I say is, are you hungry? She's like, yeah, yeah, I am. And surprisingly, I discovered that she's hungry. <laughs> And she didn't realize that she was. And she didn't realize she was couching it in a question instead of a statement. So now she comes to me and she goes, I'm hungry. And I go, awesome, let's get some food. But you know, when you're grown up and you were a kid that was told to just shut up and be quiet and not say anything, you don't disclose what's going on in your life. And so you find other ways of it coming out. We're very complex human beings. But if you're sharp, and if you accept the privilege that God gives to you, you can dissect all these things and figure out what's of me and what's of him because of the word of God. It says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it separates to the separation of bone and marrow between soul and and spirit, and it is the judge of the thought and intents of the heart. The word of God is a double-edged sword, and it cuts deep to the very core of your bone, and it separates bone from marrow, and it separates soul, which is of you, and spirit, which is of God. The word of God uniquely will cleaver things so that you know what's of you and what's of him. If you don't get in, don't be amazed if you don't know what God's will is or where you're going. Make sense? Yeah. You guys are so quiet. Matthew 6.10, if you remember Jesus instructing the disciples on how to pray, he says, this is how you should pray. This is the way in which you should pray. By the way, it's a format. It's not a, a rote word for word magic spell, just so that you know. Because most people say, our Father, we're in the other, 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 other. Amen. And that's how people say it, which isn't really a prayer at all. It's just mumbling. But Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this way. And he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means we have to have some kind of a, 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 a litmus test or some kind of a, a, a true north to know what God's will is, right? It's his word. It's always his word. And that's how we can know what God's will is. And then he came and he found them sleeping. He told them to sit and watch. And they closed their eyes, which is hard to watch. Unless you're inspecting the inside of your eyelashes. So then he came and he found them sleeping. This is Peter, James, and John, by the way. He said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? That's got to burn. Because he just said, I will never leave you. I'll, I'll do anything you tell me to do, and I'll die. You couldn't even pray for an hour. Watch and pray. Now he's adding a pray. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. When Jesus gives you a warning, it's a good idea to listen. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen? amen? Again, he went away and he prayed and he spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. 
for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I want you to look at this one line that really struck me. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, wait a minute. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, you guys picked that up? He didn't call him Peter. He said it to Peter, but he said, Simon. Now, Simon is his old name, right? Jesus renamed him. But he's reminding him he's the same old guy. <laughs> and you'll find anytime Jesus calls him Simon, he's referring to the guy he once was. And the funny thing is, Simon means hearing. And the dude's sleeping. So he's not hearing. And it's interesting, just the juxtaposition of all of these terminologies. So he says to Peter, Simon, you who is hearing, sleeping, you all rested now. And they didn't know what to say. Would you? You know what? Easiest way to fall asleep if you have trouble falling asleep? Pray. I don't know about you, but rolling things out of my head and into prayer and rolling them before the Lord, best way to fall asleep. Yep. Amen. You got stuff in your heart, or maybe the Lord woke you up just so you could pray. So you might be a partner with something he wants to do. He wants you to pray about it because he already has a plan to do it. And then suddenly you pray about it, and it's like, oh, it happened. It happens. Praying was requested for their benefit. Notice he says, watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. He's telling Peter to pray, not for Jesus's benefit. Pray, pray that the Lord, saw, you know, salves my wounds and helps me to do what I have to do. Jesus isn't saying pray for him. He's saying pray for yourself so that you don't enter into temptation because there is a giant crowd of soldiers on their way. And Peter's about to do something really stupid. He's going to try to defend the God of heaven. And he says, Peter, notice he didn't talk to all three of them. He talked to Peter because there's always somebody responsible, right? Peter's in charge. And he calls him Simon. I just think it's so cool. So there are some other things that are worth losing sleep over, right? Jesus comes and finds them asleep. I wonder how often the Lord would find you asleep at the wheel, you know, and he tells you to do something. You know, and there's a sleep that's permitted that God gives, and there's a rest that he provides, and then there's a time when you're just trying to escape your troubles. Some people, with the weight of things in their own heart, will crawl up in a little ball and just sleep and think they're going to sleep their troubles away. Sleep is a wonderful reformative thing for us, but and they don't even understand all of the implications of sleep and what it does to the brain and the chemistry and all of that and why it's such a needed reset. But then there's sleep where you take sleep to get away from something you don't want to deal with. Not with you good people, of course. <laughs> You all look at me like, I can't, I can't, Pastor Dave has really got some problems, man. Really. <laughs> Start looking for somebody new. Jesus is fighting temptation in the garden, and he is the second Adam. He seeks his disciples to pray that they do not fall into temptation. It's interesting. The first battle with the devil and temptation took place in a garden with Adam. Even Adam gave up, and they sinned. Jesus is in a garden being tempted and being pushed, and he's successful. But it means that he sacrifices his life. It begins and ends in the garden. And if you go to the book of Revelation, you know what you find at the end of the book of Revelation? A garden. Amen. You have to trust me on that. Or, or go check it out. <laughs> Luke twenty two forty three. It says, Luke giving us a fuller picture than what we hear from Mark is, and it says, and then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. 
It's an amazing thing. I wonder what else the disciples missed while they were sleeping. <laughs> Seeing an angel. Wow, that would be cool. Mostly the angels come and they, they usually bring food, which I think is the coolest Uber Eats you could ever have. <laughs> You see Elijah, he's running, he's depressed, he's all curled up in a fetal position under a bush. He says, God, just kill me now. And so what he does is he gets fed and he, he, he runs on that for 40 days and nights on that food. Moses, and you look through and you see angels come and ministering in the way that is needed because, you know, none of us can do it on our own. Amen. And then he came to the third time and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? You notice with Peter, everything's threes. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer, he is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came to the chief priests and the scribes, and the elders. So here they come. And I'm not sure which movie you watched this on or whether you understood this. In one of the other passages, it just says that there was a cohort that was sent. You don't know what a cohort is. A cohort is one-tenth of a legion. That's a hundred men. They sent a hundred men after Jesus and his 11 disciples. Why do you suppose they did that? Because Judas told them, you better not come here and think this is going to be easy. You better make sure you're going to, you don't know this guy like I do. I mean, he casts demons out. He's healing people left and right. He feeds people with just a couple of fish and some loaves. You don't, you don't know this guy like I do. You better bring the power if you want to take him. And it's interesting that night, the other gospels give us a fuller picture of what happens but in verse 44, he continues, Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and he said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And then they laid their hands on him and took him. What? This guy has been traveling with Jesus for a good part of three and a half years. And he comes up and he honors him by calling him rabbi. It's, a, it's an honored term, rabboni, which means you're my rabbi. That's, you're like my discipler. You're the one whom I follow. And that's what he calls him. And then he kisses him. Now, men, it's weird when other men will kiss you. It's not really our culture. But that was a common form of greeting back there. It was a kiss on the cheek. But that's not what a kiss is for, right? It's like hugging somebody. A, a hug is not to, you know, put somebody in a headlock and put them down. A hug is for a greeting, right? It's like there's nothing between us, man. I love you. I forgive you. I have nothing but love for you. That's what a hug is for. That's what a kiss is for. And he turns that into being such a reprehensible thing, and he uses it to literally point Jesus out to be captured. Listen to what Judas says. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, seize that one, seize him and lead him away safely. Why? There are people that surmise that Judas may have had another plan in the back of his head. He may have wanted to push Jesus to the forefront and force the battle. He may have tried to do that. Because he uses this word safely. What in the world does he give a rip about Jesus? But he wants him to be taken away safely. Why would he say that? Right? I find all these little scriptures and I go, what in the world does that mean? I'm going to ask him. When I get to heaven, I say, Lord, what did that mean? What was in his head? And so they kissed Jesus, and Jesus may have had a face like that. Luke twenty two forty eight 48 says, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You see, the book of Mark doesn't give us the fullest pictures, the facts, facts, ma'am, just the facts. 
but we get it from Luke. Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss, Judas? Do you see Jesus giving him an opportunity even there to repent? Jesus, all the way to the end, is giving Judas a chance to repent. Opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. It might be why Judas was so cut to the heart and he said, I have betrayed innocent blood and he threw the money back into the temple and he went and hung himself. That might explain why he did that because it doesn't make any sense to me. He's not repenting. He's not apologizing. He's not asking Jesus to forgive him. He's, he's remorseful about what he did, but everyone in prison is remorseful and they might do it again. So why would he do that? It just seems like if the money was that important, he would have thrown it back, but he did. And then why would he go and hang himself? It might be that he had another plan in the back of his head and he wanted Jesus to go safely and he wanted to, you know, make the thriller in Manila, you know, and have the clash between the religious system and the Messiah. It may be, but you know, that wasn't God's plan. And sometimes we try to fabricate things that we think might be a good idea. And I think Judas is a picture of that. Now it says further in John 18, it says, Jesus therefore knowing all things that, he, that would come upon him, and he went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? This is when this cohort arrives. These men, you know, they surround him. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. It's actually, he says, I am, which is the sacred name of God, by the way. He says, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you, I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. There's Matthew pulling an Old Testament passage out saying it, it was prophesied that this would be. Jesus protected his disciples from being captured along with him. He says, who are you looking for? I'm your man. And it says they all fell back. By the way, they didn't fall back on one knee and say, Please forgive us, Lord, for what we're doing. No, they didn't do that. They, the front row stepped back like this, and they stepped on the toes of the guys behind them, and they started falling, and they started falling. And it was dominoes <laughs> with torches and swords drawn. A bunch of guys falling down like a bunch of army men. They got up, put their clothes out, <laughs> looked around, and he goes... Who are you looking for? <laughs> Let's try this again. <laughs> when you read all the scriptures together, you get the fuller picture, which I find incredible. And one of those who stood by drew his sword. You know who that was? Peter. Just because you read it in John. <laughs> and one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. I think it's amazing that we're talking about this the day after. Anyway. And then Jesus answered and said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then they all forsook him and fled. Now that's Mark's short story of what occurred. Notice Peter isn't named. The, the high priest's servant is not named. And the ear is not named. I just want you to notice some things that aren't there. Because here in John 18, 10, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword... You see, John's a tattletale. <laughs> then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now we know which ear it was. The servant's name was Malchus. It's interesting. So now we have the ear and we have the dude's name. You know, this isn't 
a coincidence, and people didn't make this story up. This is an actual thing that occurred. And just because Mark doesn't mention it doesn't mean that John won't. And it doesn't mean that Mark was wrong. He's just telling a shorter story, right? right. So when people come to you, the Bible can't be real because it's inconsistent. They, you got four guys who tell four different stories. Well, try to get four people to give the same story. Watch a football game and have, get, see if you can get four stories the same, <laughs> identical. It won't happen. Anyway, the servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup in which the Father has given me? So we actually have some dialogue from Jesus during all of this and what he tells Peter. Not only that, Luke tells us something a little different. Luke 22, 49 to 51. When those around him saw what was going to happen, those around him, it's all the disciples, generic. They said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Who do you think that was? That's Peter. Of course it is. The one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. How would you feel about arresting a guy who was trying to protect you and put your ear back on? Would you feel like maybe you're doing something you shouldn't be doing? <laughs> like, it doesn't say it, but I imagine Jesus said, permit this for just a minute. I'm not reaching for a gun. I'm just picking up your ear. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so he heals him. And he gives Peter some information. In one of the other passages, it says, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Peter, if this is the way that you're going to live, this is the way you're going to die. If you're going to pull a sword out every time, you know, something's going on that you don't understand and can't explain, you're going to die by the sword. It's good advice, right? Amen. Then it gets weird. Now, a certain young man followed them, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth, and he fled them naked. By the way, you will find this in no other gospel other than the gospel of Mark. There are historians who believe it had to be John Mark. It had to be the author himself telling the story of how he had nothing on but a sheet. And he was following behind, and suddenly all of the, the soldiers said, hey, we're being followed. Okay, no problem. Let's wait for him. And they jump out and they grab him and they grab him by the sheet he's covered with and just to discover the kid's naked, there's nothing really to grab. And so he ends up running away naked into the night when Jesus was beat. And you go, what are you doing in a garden naked with a sheet around you? That sounds creepy, doesn't it? <laughs> you fast forward to today's day and age and that would be, you know, that's a punishable offense right there. It's reason that Mark, we're going to find out later in the book of Acts, John Mark's house was a place that the disciples went. It was where Bible studies were. It's where prayer meetings happened. It may be that this cohort went through town past the door of John Mark's house. John Mark was sent to make sure that they all get out of Dodge. And that might explain why he had nothing but a bed sheet on and he ran. It's supposition. But I like supposition. Sometimes it's helpful. Because I'd hate to think he just, you know, I got to sleep naked. I, I have to sleep naked or I can't get to sleep. I don't know. It's one of those things. I'd, I'd rather think that he probably found out and he was sent to warn them. And as he got there, everything went down. And then he was walking back home behind where they were going, into town. He wasn't following them. He was trying to go home. So I don't know. And they led Jesus away to the high priest and with him, were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, but Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants, and he warmed himself at the fire. We'll pick it up there next week. I hope you guys are enjoying the book of Mark. There's 
so many things to be learned just looking through how Jesus handles everything. And it's funny, this part of the scripture is not necessarily Jesus is the main character. It's everyone else who is doing to Jesus. And so it's a little bit different um, the way we look at it. I hope you guys will join us next week and we'll pick it up from there. If the worship team could come up, we'll have one more song. <laughs>